Hi there, everyone, and a very warm welcome to St. Stephen's Online Service. I'm Jez, the Vicar at St. Stephen's, and your host for this service today. In a few minutes, Rachel Bedford, our Associate Vicar, will be speaking to us, and Rachel's going to be carrying on the mini-series I began a couple of weeks ago, reflecting on our call as a church to serve people and communities both locally and globally. You may also know that in this month of November, we've set ourselves an ambitious target at St. Stephen's to raise £60,000 of new giving, new money, to resource the work that we feel called to both at home and abroad, while still breaking even in our finances at the end of the year. And I just wanted to say two things really quickly about that. First of all, thank you so much for the generous response that there's already been this month to that ambitious target, especially when you consider these very challenging economic times that we're all living through. So far, more than £37,000 has been raised out of the 60 that we're aiming for. That's an incredibly generous response already. So thank you so much. Secondly, I wanted to say that next Sunday, that's November the 27th, that's the final Sunday of our giving appeal. So if you are wanting to make a response and you haven't done so already, just to let you know that Sunday, November the 27th, is the deadline for making that response. And if you do want to respond at the end of the service today, this QR code will stay up on the screen. And if you scan it, it will take you through to the giving page on our website. Alternatively, you can go directly to our website in your own time. You can see the website address there. Or you can phone our church office on the number that you can see now if you'd like to talk to someone about the practicalities of giving to St. Stephen's. Every little helps in the current climate. So thank you so much for considering this. Now I'd like to pray. Then we're going to have our opening song of worship after which Rachel will speak to us. So let's pray. Father, thank you for all of your goodness, your faithfulness and your generosity towards each one of us. And in this service, we pray that you will draw near to us as we draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's enjoy our opening song of worship, Faithful Now. I'm holding on to faith Cause I know you make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall Give you songs of praise To shape prayers and war my doubt is you were faithful then and you be faithful now oh you're faithful Jesus I'm standing on 
Today's reading is taken from Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When I was at university in the dining room where we used to eat, there were portraits around all four walls of the room. All of the portraits were of white men. Most of them looked about 60 or something like that. Now, no disrespect to white men over 60 who might be watching, but as an 18-year-old female, I have to say that I have seen more inspiring artwork than was on these walls. But one portrait caught my eye, and it was this one. A few months into my degree, I began to ask questions about who this woman was. How had she made it onto the walls amidst all the men? And I discovered that it was a woman called Hannah Marshman. And I was fascinated by her story, so much so that I decided to write my dissertation on her life and work. Hannah was born in 1767. And she married Joshua, who was a Baptist minister in 1791. They had two children who sadly died shortly after birth, but then they went on to have two more children called John and Susanna. Joshua, in his mid-thirties, sensed a call to travel with the Baptist Missionary Society to Serampur, India. He was inspired by William Carey, one of the great preachers of the evangelical revival. And so the Marshmans left England in May 1799 by boat and arrived in October 1799. During the voyage, Hannah gave birth to their third child, who she named Benjamin because the ship's captain had that name. Can we just pause for a moment and think about the reality of that for Hannah? She had two small children on a boat for six months and then she gave birth to a third child right in the middle of that journey. I sometimes complain about what I call cabin fever when I'm kind of holed up with my small children on a rainy Saturday afternoon. But this is complete next level cabin fever. The Marshmans arrived in Serampore after this perilous journey and began to establish some schools. They taught literacy alongside teaching the Bible. During my studies, I managed to secure some funding and I went to Yorkshire to read Hannah's original diaries, which are stored in a family archive. And as I read her diaries, which I think had been largely untouched since the 18th century, I was so inspired by her pioneering spirit. She argued passionately for the importance of schools for girls at a time when girls were largely never educated. So for me, writing this dissertation on overseas mission was not just intellectually interesting, but it was spiritually stretching, reflecting that this family made such a journey at great personal sacrifice that they would go in the hope that they could do good and bring those in the communities they served into the Christian faith. I find myself asking the question, would I go? But also I was asking a whole host of other questions. Was it really necessary for the Marshmans to go? Surely there was church work that could have been done at home, which would have saved them that arduous six month journey by boat. How appropriate was it even that they would land in a fully Hindu place and begin teaching the Bible? Much modern day overseas mission has its origins here in the 18th and 19th century. But the world has changed vastly since then. And the reality is that many of us in the church, let alone outside the church, find the premise that we, many of us as Western Christians, should travel to other countries to share faith. 
We struggle with that concept. And there are many modern critiques and concerns about mission. We want to avoid the so-called saviour complex. The idea that as Westerners, we've got all the answers and that we can go and teach and change and show those of other races and cultures how life should be done. This is a problem because it can lead to mission work, which is about our own egos rather than the people that we're going to serve. Economically, we're also aware of our privilege and perhaps question the appropriateness of traveling to less privileged places, carrying with us maybe an air of superiority. And third, what about the whole concept of conversion? Maybe this is actually questionable. We find ourselves asking, is it ever appropriate as a goal that we would ask people of other faiths to convert to Christianity? This unease is very current. In July of this year, the Pope made a public apology to Canada's native people for the church's role in indigenous schools. He apologised for the colonising mentality of the church and called for a serious investigation to help survivors and descendants heal. So where do we go from here? How do we think and do missions well? Well, firstly, we go, as we always do, to the Bible. Jesus commanded the first disciples to go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There is no ambiguity here. The instruction is to go to all nations and to actively disciple people, which if we look at the life of Jesus and how he discipled people, it means speaking and teaching the Bible and to baptize new disciples. Second, in Revelation 7, John paints a glorious picture of all peoples from every nation and tribe and tongue gathered together in worship. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So if this is a vision of the world as it should be, then it will only be possible if all nations have heard the news about Jesus so they can decide if they want to stand before his throne in worship. And so this talk today follows on from Jez's talk a fortnight ago, which I encourage you to listen to if you haven't already, where he spoke about St. Stephen's commitment to mission both locally and abroad. We have several mission partners that we support who have sensed God's unique call to go abroad, inspired by the Great Commission, to share the news of Jesus with those who are yet to hear it. And yet, how do we and how do they do it well, given the issues and sensitivities I've already raised? Well, here's a few reflections which I hope you find helpful. Firstly, choice is paramount. Throughout the Bible, God acts in such a way as to give his people choice. Now, this begins in Eden, but is constant throughout. God doesn't force himself on anyone. There's no coercion here, but rather he loves all people unconditionally and offers a relationship with him. It is, we could argue, a basic human right to choose whether to follow or not Jesus. So everyone sent to speak the good news of Jesus needs to appreciate and protect the freedoms of those in a native country. The book of Romans says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news is offered, not forced. But there remains lots of people who simply do not have this choice because they haven't yet heard about Jesus. We need people to go. Secondly, we need to think about mission as pilgrims, not saviours. One way of avoiding the white saviour complex is to imagine overseas mission as pilgrimage. Michael Stroop, in his book Transcending Mission, argues that when we discover God, we become pilgrim witnesses who are called to live alongside and love others we might encounter along the way, be those people here locally or abroad. A pilgrim doesn't purport to have all the answers, but journeys with others sharing along the way. And that's why the partners that we support talk about building relationships with those around them, serving selflessly, and in that being the good news of Jesus as much as speaking it. The communities they go to are not inferior, 
or behind or in need of catching up with us. These are people who are loved deeply by Christ. They simply have not heard about him. And so Jesus says and commands us still today, go as pilgrims, not saviours. Finally, we need to think about mission both locally and globally. Andrew Scott, who is the leader of Operation Mobilization in America, has written a compelling book called Scattered. And in this book, he deconstructs the idea that some of us are called to give up the secular and to go into this sacred work of missions. The problem with that model, he argues, is that the majority of us are just left in the sidelines. This relegates talent, passions and work. And as a result, the vast majority of the church are called just to occasionally pray or to give a little towards missions. And in a moment, we will ask you to do both of those things, but it would be remiss of me not to ask the question, is there something more for you in relation to this commission in Matthew 28 to go? There's something more could be local or global. In this book, Scattered, Andrew Scott refers to Jesus's description of his followers as salt and light. He says, we don't apply salt to anything one grain at a time. It's normally scattered as it is shaken out of the shaker. So maybe God is calling you to go near or far. Maybe he is calling you to go to India like Hannah and Joshua Marshman. But maybe he's calling you to go to Hope Church Hounslow to support their food bank, or to go to St. Peter's Kingston to support their midweek lunch for refugees. How open are we to the places God might be calling us to go to, the places he might be scattering us in? Jesus said, therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that really inspiring message. And as we think about Jesus's call to, to go and be in the places and amongst the people that he has put on our hearts, I wanted to let you know some personal news for me and for us as the Barnes family. That news is that I've felt a growing stirring since the start of this year, that the Lord is getting me ready for a new chapter and a new adventure for us as a family. And in particular, I've felt what I think has been a nudge from the Holy Spirit to put myself forward for the role of a school chaplain, coming alongside pupils and staff, parents too as well, in ways that are supportive, encouraging and which gently point people to Jesus in ways that I hope could be credible and which would connect. So I wanted to let you know today that just a few weeks ago, I accepted the offer of a new role to become school chaplain at Dauncey's School in Wiltshire. At Dauncey's is an independent co-educational secondary school with about 800 pupils and about 300 staff. And the role of chaplain is essentially to be a pastor to the whole of that school community of 1,100 people. And that's an opportunity and a challenge that I'm excited about stepping into next year. I'll be starting in that new role in September 2023, so I'm not going anywhere just yet. I'll continue to be here at St. Stephen's for the next eight months or so. And I hope that that lead-in time will give us as a family a good amount of time to prepare for what will be a really big change for all of us. And I hope it will also helpfully give St. Stephen's a good amount of lead-in time to plan well for recruiting a new vicar in due course. So of course, in the next eight months, there'll be plenty of time for me and for us as a family to express our, our heartfelt gratitude and our, our deep thankfulness for all that being at St. Stephen's over the past 13 and a bit years has meant to us. It really has meant so much. This community is incredibly special and will be really sad in so many ways to, to make the move on from it to the next chapter of our lives. But it does feel the right time for us as a family to be making that move. And I feel really confident that there are going to be exciting and fruitful new chapters ahead too 
for St. Stephen's in the future under the leadership of a new vicar who will be appointed in due course. I also wanted to say that I'm really delighted that Rachel, our associate vicar, and Nicola, our director of operations, are fully committed to being here and to seeing St. Stephen's through that change of vicar next year. The staff team we're blessed with is as talented and strong and united as I've ever experienced it being. And our two fantastic church wardens, Sarah Goff and Colin Matthews, are also fully committed to continuing in their roles and overseeing the process with the PCC for the recruitment of a new vicar when that time comes. So lots more time in the weeks and the months ahead to chat with you all more about this. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Colin, one of our church wardens, to say a few words before we enjoy a final hymn together. And then after that hymn, I'll close our service with a prayer of blessing. So Colin, over to you. Well, I'll be really sorry. We'll all be sorry when Jez leaves us next year. In that context, I wanted to make three points. The first one is, much as we'll all be sorry to leave, see Jez leave, let's tackle this transition positively. You know, every healthy organization sees a change in leadership from time to time. And from Jez's point of view, he's described a job which he wants to do and where he's got such a terrific contribution to make. And, you know, it's consistent with St. Stephen's standing as a resource church that people, leaders, others go out from here, as they've done so many times before, to serve the Lord in other places. So let's tackle this upcoming transition positively. Secondly, uh, the process, the steps we need to go through to find Jez's successor is laid out by the Church of England. And in that, Sarah Goff and I together have a role to oversee the process. And we undertake to do so prayerfully and diligently. I won't go into the details right now, but I can tell you it does involve contributions from the PCC, from the staff team, from people right across the church. So we look forward, Sarah and I look forward to working with many of you in the coming months as we go through those steps. And we really ask for the prayers of the whole church to the right outcome from that process. Third point, as Jez has said, he's here for a good few months still to come. And I believe we can, actually we must maintain the work, the momentum, the work of the St. Stephen's in 2023, because it's so important. In that context, I want to thank you for everything you're doing, contributing to the life of St. Stephen's today. And in advance, I want to thank you for everything that you're going to contribute in 2023. It is so important. The work of a church is not one person. It's hundreds of people right across uh, our whole congregation. So thank you in advance for all you're doing. Uh, every single contribution is vital. We need it. And I'm looking forward to seeing everything that the Lord has in store for us in 2023.
Amen. Well, that is our prayer, isn't it? That Christ will be magnified uh, in our lives, in the life of our church, both now, the remainder of this year, and indeed into all that 2023 will bring. So let me pray a final prayer of blessing for each one of us as we close. So now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, both now and always. Amen. <laughs>